there's a changing of the guard at RPV City Hall. After serving as city manager for almost seven years, Carolyn Lair is stepping down. As of February the 1st, Deputy City Manager Carolyn Petru will step in and serve as the interim city manager. Lair said she decided not to seek renewal of her contract to spend more time with her family. I knew uh, the time was quickly approaching. Uh, for me to uh, think about uh, asking the council to renew my contract. And uh, being a city manager is a big commitment. Uh, by the end of this term, which would be June 30th, it will, I will have served as city manager for a total of seven years, which actually is quite remarkable as city managers go. So I'm very proud of that. And uh, the next renewal then would be a commitment of um, presumably a few or several more years. So at this time in my life, I thought that it would be best if I took the opportunity to uh, create some flexibility for myself. And uh, uh, my husband is working in Northern California and uh, we are a commuter couple, have been for a few years now. So with all that in mind, and yet our kids are here and we love it here in RPV, probably the ideal thing would be to uh, have some flexibility. Uh, the, the toughest part is just the thought of not working with all the great council members, as well as the tremendous staff uh, that we've built at City Hall, so I'll definitely miss that and the wonderful projects uh, that, that I've been fortunate to, uh, uh, to be a part of. Lair said she plans to stay involved in the community and will remain an active member of the Palos Verdes Rotary Club. Lair said she will do all she can to assist in a smooth transition at City Hall. RPV Mayor Jerry Dehovic said it could take up to a year to hire a new city manager. Dehovic spoke with Liz Brown Swanson about the transition and the search for a new city manager. And I do want to acknowledge and thank Carolyn for all of her hard work. Uh, you know, she did put her heart into this and she was a, a good representative of the, of the city publicly. Uh, she worked very hard at what she did and you know there were a lot of accomplishments that, that transpired under under her watch you know you had Terranea came to fruition and completion uh, we, got, we, we got yeah. we got hundreds of new acre uh, new acreage in the in the preserve if not you know thousands of acres and trails during her tenure um, storm Dame projects you just said San Ramon that's a big one we also had McCarroll Canyon during that time frame and we also had um, you know, the implementation of the, the storm drain user fee and the, the governance thereof. So there was a lot that went on there and I'm just, I'm just scratching the surface. So personally, I want to thank Carolyn for mm -hmm. her service. And I think the, the city, you know, owes her a debt of gratitude for her leadership during this tenure, regardless of what your feelings are on what transpired during that seven years. She did it. Right. She worked very hard at it. But uh, so we got notice in December. Um, at that point in time, the council, along with the city attorney, worked to come up with a transition plan. Obviously, there, there are legal issues associated with that. Um, we, we came up with a plan. We came up with a separation agreement to, to discuss and outline how we were going to move forward. Part of that was um, basically on the 30th, 31st of January, Carolyn is going to step away from the day-to-day -day duties. Uh, February 1st, Carolyn Petru, our deputy city manager, is going to step in as interim city manager or acting city manager. Uh, and by the way, we're going to be very well served. Um, by Carolyn Petra. She's got almost, you know, 30 years of service. She's been held almost every senior position there is. Uh, very smart, very capable. My number one goal, and again, the number one goal of the council was to ensure continuity, um, to ensure um, that, that services continue at a very high level. And I'm extremely confident that under Carolyn Petru's uh, guidance that that will continue and that, you know, staff morale and things along those lines will, will stay at a very high level. Right. Um, <clears throat> at that point, I just brought forward at the last council meeting during the study session the topic of the recruitment, basically uh, going out and looking for a new city manager. We have to formalize that. We want to talk about that publicly, so we need to get it on the agenda. Uh, that was brought forward in a study session. I will have some preliminary meetings with, uh, with our HR people, Sean Robinson, 
Um, but very, very, just to you know, give you a succinct uh, discussion about the process, we will, in all likelihood, uh, engage a consultant, a headhunter, if you will, uh, that will assist us. And that's normally the way it's done. There are companies that specialize in, in city managers, believe it or mm -hmm. not. Uh, that we will likely engage one of those to help us, but we're gonna we're gonna figure out exactly if there's any changes in the qualifications of the city manager we want. Uh, that process may take three, six, nine months, may take up to a year. But again, I'm I'm comfortable that that we're in good hands um, with Carolyn Petru and with this council helping out and with the senior staff that we have at City Hall. And for all of our residents who may be traveling over the president's holiday weekend, well, you might want to think again, especially if you're planning to travel on the 405 freeway. Jamzilla has arrived. Authorities are warning travelers to stay away from the 405 freeway as lanes and off-ramps will have limited use or be closed during the weekend. The 80-hour paving operation over the long weekend will eliminate the need for several full closure weekends to avoid massive traffic delays, officials are recommending detours or if possible to stay out of the congested area completely. For hours and further information on the closures, you can go to the website at metro.net. And when we come back, is your city prepared in case of an emergency? You'll find out coming up next. Hi, I'm Deputy Chris Knox. I'm here to remind you of the importance of sharing the road. If you are driving, watch out for motorcycles. They can be hard to see. When you ride a motorcycle, always make sure to wear full reinforced safety gear, including a jacket, long jeans, boots, gloves, and a DOT approved helmet. There are four components to a DOT compliant motorcycle helmet. A DOT sticker, a metal D-ring clasp, an inch of padding, and a manufacturer's label. If you need more information regarding motorcycle safety gear, make sure to check out your local motorcycle dealer or the Motorcycle Safety Foundation. When we follow these rules, we can all share the roads safely. This message is brought to you by the City of Rancho Palos Verdes and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. The City of Rancho Palos Verdes, under the guidance of the Emergency Preparedness Committee, stays well trained in case of a natural disaster. During a recent drill, we had a chance to talk to city officials as well as emergency personnel about how well prepared the city is in case of a real emergency. Talk about the drill today as far as what it simulated, what kind of a disaster. Um, we based it again on an earthquake, a large earthquake hitting the, uh, the city, and um, went from a cold setup, what we call the EOC when it isn't set up and ready to go and operational, and took the staff through a cold setup through some incidents uh, of the earthquake, and uh, we took it as a breakdown and uh, finished up with everything being put away and everyone having their after action reports together and we talked about things we can improve. Basically that's how it went. You've been involved in this for a few years now. I noticed this time everybody was really organized. There were people asking questions to make things go a little smoother. It was faster. Just talk about uh, just the repetitiveness of this and how much further they've come. They've come uh, miles, miles and miles really. Like when I, when I said earlier, you know, if I could float after this is done, I really would be floating off the ground right now. Um, they're very attentive, they care, the staff here really cares. Um, they work hard, we only get to do this once a year. So, you know, it's kind of hard if you're not practicing something often. Um, but they, they just moved right into it this time. And I know next time we'll, we'll get even better, um, we'll be more responsive, and I'm just really, really excited how well everybody did. And, and we're just gonna do nothing but get better. What kind of a message could we tell the residents that the city is really prepared in case of an emergency, and what they can maybe do to help. What they can really do to help is, is self-preparedness. It's re prepare yourself, prepare your home with your supplies, your earthquake kits, um, plenty of water, plenty of food. Um, we have plenty of resources here uh, at RPV on our website um, that you can you can have to set you up with a nice earthquake package, um, set you up for 10 days for your home, three days for a personal use, um, backpacks, things like that. Uh, we do sell for three days uh, personal use. You're going to be on your own for a while and it's going to take a while for help to get to you so the more you can do on your own the better you're going to be. Thank you. 
And where can people find backpacks or information? Um, the backpacks that we have here, they're sold, sold down at uh, what we call PVIC, Point Vicente Interpretive Center. Um, they're sold there. They're for $39.95, and they are a full pack, and it's got the uh, Rancho Palos Verdes logo on it. And uh, it's good for three days, and it's a nice to have in your car or your office. You know, very. this will keep you going for three days, and then by then you should be able to, you know, get other supplies from other places. But uh, So that's where you can get the three-day supplies. The city has come a long way in the last few years in improving its responsiveness to a disaster. And today's drill was very impressive in how the EOC came together in just about 12 minutes from start. And I think we're well equipped in uh, handling whatever needs come our way. When you think about over the years, there, there are some changes to make it a little bit um, maybe more challenging, but also um, to make it more efficient. Yeah, well, certainly to make it more challenging, um, it would be desirable to have a lot more incidents coming in almost simultaneously, hitting you right and left. In that case, the uh, section heads need to start making priorities and decisions based on the available resources they have on hand relative to all the incidents that are coming in. And the common thread in a lot of disaster response is doing the most good for the most people with the resources you have. And so that's what would make this exercise even better, uh, is having more incidents coming in. All of the employees and the staff in the EOC seem much more prepared, which makes them more confident. Um, so it's run, it was a lot smoother this year. This was run um, very much like what an actual emergency is going to run like when we do have brush fires out here. Um, the city, it seems like a lot of the things the employees are thinking about, it, it's great. Their, their minds are going exactly for what they need to be prepared for. And so the more that the city can be prepared ahead of time doing these drills, it, it's like for the fire department. We drill every day. So when the actual disaster happens, it just it comes naturally and that's exactly what the city's perspective is. As a, as a councilman to come into a, a situation where there would be a disaster, what would your role be? Uh, my role would be come up here to the conference room and be briefed on what the status is um, and part of what my role would be and the other council members would be to communicate to the public uh, what the status is and what where our emergency um, um, responders are and what roads are closed and, and kind of give the, the community a status of what's, what's going on. Okay. Can you just talk about the importance of basically, basically being in a city where probably everything will be cut off from help and just how important that is for residents to know to be prepared? Well, yeah, the, fir the, first, the first thing is you, you take care of your own family. That's number one. So, and, and that's during an emergency. Before the emergency, of course, you want to have your emergency supplies and water and so on. Um, but uh, the first thing is to take care of your own family. And then uh, sometimes if there's a cert certified people that may go in the community and help other people, but you need to take care of your own family first. These kinds of drills are so crucial because people are going, the staff is going to be traumatized. You know, if there really is a disaster, they'll be thinking about many issues. So the fact that they're going to have this sort of psychological set in their mind of, I come in this room and, and this is how I set up and these are my priorities and, and this is how I um, triage uh, whatever's going on. So I think it will, uh, it, it will be in many ways uh, very beneficial for, for this kind of practice to go on. And for all you sweethearts out there, Valentine's Day is just around the corner, and so is the Valentine's Ball at the Terranea Resort. This annual fundraiser supports the Norris Theater and will be filled with show-stopping entertainment. I caught up with Tracy Cloud, who tells us more. The ball this year is our largest fundraiser for the Norris. Mm -hmm. And we are very, very excited that it's not just going to be regular dinner and dance. Okay. Um, we are having a tribute to the Phantom of the Opera this year. And we are doing um, a uh, celebrity honoree this year in addition to our Key to the Heart Award honoree. Okay. And we are very excited about it. Our first special guest is our Key to the Heart uh, honoree, okay. 
and this year is Myla Azer, and she is a phenomenal, phenomenal Nora supporter, and she has uh, done this position, the chair position, I think three years in a row, and she is a uh, honoree at the Norris, and she's in multiple support groups for the Norris. The other special guest is our celebrity honoree, and we've never done that before, and that is Davis Gaines. And Davis was very special to Joan Moe. Mm -hmm. And so we decided that it would be a great uh, tribute to Joan to ask him to be our celebrity honoree wow. for this ball that is after her passing. So we're um, very excited about having him there and honoring her, him that night. So tell us about where it's going to be held and what date and what time. The ball is February 1st. It starts at 5 o'clock and it's going to be at the beautiful Terranea Resort. Terranea has been wonderful to us and they have helped us get, get to that location. We've also created a website just specifically for the ball and that is bidpal.net. Valentine Ball 2014. So it, if you go to that web address, you can buy everything. Cornerstone Elementary School is hosting an open house on Saturday, February the 1st from 2 to 4 p.m. This event gives the community a chance to explore Cornerstone's unique learning environment as a parent participation school. Cornerstone's commitment is to educate the whole child and captures the talents of one of the most valuable resources, the parents. To find out more, you can stop by the open house this Saturday, February the 1st from 2 to 4 p.m. As the new year begins, many people renew their fitness goals, but what about those extra love handles that never seem to go away? A new medical procedure called cool sculpting might be the answer for you. I caught up with Lindsay McFarland at Medelity Medical who talks about what cool sculpting is and how it freezes away the fat forever. So cool sculpting, it's so phenomenal. We are so excited to have this machine. What happened was uh, two Harvard scientists discovered that the fat cells in your body freeze at a higher temperature than any of the other cells in your body. That includes your skin cells, your muscle cells, everything like that. So what they did was they created this machine that can take a certain area of your body that you're having trouble with, such as a love handle or the muffin top in the front, the lower abdominals, or a lot of people have trouble trouble with their tricep area and uh, it takes this area and brings it down to that temperature that damages the fat cells without hurting any of the other cells in your body. Mm -hmm. So therefore those cells go into apoptosis and your body naturally metabolizes them over the next 12 weeks and the great thing about fat cells is that once you get rid of them that way they never come back. Wow. And it, the process, how long does it take? What's the downtime? How many times do you have to do that? The, the process takes about an hour, and so it's, it doesn't take any time at all. And the great thing is that it's not painful. Your body, it, it is cold, and your body will naturally numb out, so you don't even need any form of numbing outside of the machine itself. So it'll take 12 weeks to see the final result, and we recommend people get uh, two to three treatments depending on what type of results they're wanting. Some people want more of a drastic result because this will get rid of 25% of the fat cells in the particular area each time you do it cumulatively. Wow. So the first time you do it, it'll be 25%. Second time, it'll be 25% of what's left. So just depending on if they want it all gone or if they just want a little bit of a difference to get back into that skinny black dress, then that's what will offer them. Now, where does the fat cells go if you're not taking them out physically? Good question. Your body naturally metabolizes them, so they will go um, through the bloodstream into the liver, and you. so you won't even know that your body is is doing this. It's really fantastic how it's it doesn't hurt. It's the non-invasive way, and you can. Um, we actually have photographs of patients who did gain weight afterwards, and in the areas that they got this done, you can't even tell that they gained weight. Wow. 
because, yeah, because your body only has a certain amount of fat cells when you're born and it stays with that the entire time. But the thing is, is that, I mean, if you do go out and go crazy and go start eating, you know, burgers every day, then the fat cells that are remaining in that area can increase in size, but you'll never regain the amount of fat cells. Medellity Medical is located in Golden Cove Plaza. For more information on cool sculpting, you can go to their website at medellity.com. And in sports, when Casey Celeste decided to choose a sport, he wasn't sure what direction he would go. So he just started running. And as it turned out, running put him on the right track. It kind of just came naturally because freshman year I did PE and... Uh, after freshman year, I didn't really want to do PE again because you have to fill your requirement for uh, physical education. And so I decided to do cross country because it was the, uh, you couldn't get cut from the sport. There were no tryouts and I decided to just go for it. Okay, well, you, you, try, you, you decided to go for it, but you're actually really good at it. Did you know you were going to be this good? <laughs> I, I had no idea was, I was going to be this good. I mean, I just joined to see what could happen. I mean, a lot of my friends were on the team and then each year I got a little better, a little better, and eventually I was, I was actually pretty good. You know, with other sports like soccer and basketball, there's a lot of opportunities for kids when they're younger to kind of try it out and see if they're good or not, and they, they kind of get noticed if, if they're a standout at that particular sport. But with running, you know, kids don't really do it competitively at a young age. And so most of the kids that we have in high school cross country um, didn't realize that they had a talent for it until they started doing it. You know, what motivates you to run? Because I, I think when you're doing it, you, you have to get, you know, you want to get this much quicker, this much faster. What sort of motivates you in your mind to be able to do that? It's just all the end goals at the year, the CIF, the state uh, meets, all those meets are the big, the big shows where you want to perform well. And each day, even though you might be half a year away from those days, you know that they're still, they're going to be there. And the work you put in now is going to, pay off when you're running in those races. What kind of work do you have to put in on a daily basis? Um, in the summer when you're preparing for a season you're usually running about um, nine to ten miles a day. Um, just running the distances you need to and uh, making sure you stay healthy that's the most important thing. I read that you said that um, November is when everything sort of gets turned up. Why is that? It's when uh, we start that's the end of our, it's our league final meet we have our CIF state and that's when the good teams start racing faster and faster and each race gets better and better so it's just the intensity starts to grow as you get into the the championship season cross country really requires a lot of dedication and discipline and so i think that the lessons that he's learned in cross country have carried into his academic life and his personal life so he's become a much more focused student and person at home too i was going to ask you that what is it that makes what lessons do they learn being in cross country sure the best runners uh, only get there by doing a lot of mileage and running a lot of miles. And so a lot of times that means running twice a day all year long. And if you're a high school student, running twice a day means you have to get up at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. to run before school starts. So to be able to, to have the discipline to do that when everybody else is asleep, uh, it really builds a lot of character. How do you guys motivate each other, especially when, you're, when you know you're up against some really good competition? It's just each... Each of our guys wants to do the best they can. I mean, it, cross country is a team sport, but a lot of it's individual too. And each individual out there, especially on our team, wants to run faster and trying to catch the guy ahead of him. So we each kind of keep ourselves moving, keep ourselves running faster. Is that what you think about when you're out there doing it too? Or are you focusing on something completely different in your mind? Well, during a race, it's usually pretty hectic, uh, but we're always looking for people to kind of give us a hint that we're in the right place and we always want to keep moving up and if we see our teammate and we're we know we should be behind them that's a good sign and that's the kind of things we think about during the race okay. yeah, the team is a very close-knit group um running you know you can't really stay up late at night because you have to get up early the next morning so you develop a, a peer circle that has a lot of similar kind of lifestyle choices and you know healthy eating and getting your sleep and so they they really do stick together in and out of school And if you have a sports story at your school that you would like for us to cover, you can email us at rpvtv at rpv.com. And finally, one of our local residents has a new exhibition on display at the PV Arts Center. John Clayton has more. 
I'm sitting in a room in the Palace Verdes Art Center surrounded by some really gorgeous paintings and the author or artist who did them is sitting right next to me, Don Crocker. But Don, tell me a little bit about these paintings. Um, they all have a theme and the theme is what? Well, plain air, I paint plain air. What that means is you're focusing on the light and the impact of the light on the landscape. And that happens at night and at sunset in addition to during the day. And some of these are dawn also. So I'm focusing on the impact and primarily of the moon on the landscape, plus human habitation, like there's paintings of the harbor, paintings of the uh, old 76 refinery, which is now the Conoco um, refinery, where you've got all these wonderful moonlight, stars, and uh, the habitation, lights of habitation affecting the landscape. And I see you have a book on your lap. What is that book? Well, Joe Baker and, and, uh, and, and Doug Moore put together this catalog of this show. And it's called The Colors of, Night, Colors of Twilight, The Nocturnals. And it has in here not only each image that you see on the wall here, which is like 35 images, but it also has a story underneath each of the paintings, which I wrote describing why, it's, why I painted it, why it, the unique aspects of the painting. Each of the paintings here, if you buy a painting, I will supply a frame for you of when, when you pick it up because uh, Doug Moore is an extremely creative fellow and he came up with the idea of hanging these paintings without frames. Which is, is there some problem. sort of... Um, that's a very interesting idea, to hang a painting without a, without a frame. What is the thought behind that? Well, not only that, but he painted the walls black as for night. You know, the only thing we don't have is stars in the ceiling Be and the moon. <laughs> <laughs> That's next. <laughs> because I think I would have never guessed that it would look so fantastic, but I am overjoyed at what he was able to do for this show because I think people are really quite amazed at how beautiful the paintings look. As I said just now, I urge you to come on down here. It is absolutely fascinating and really, really beautiful and I know you'll be absolutely thrilled to see them. Thank so, you very much. Well, we should say that the show will be here until the 16th of March oh, yeah. and that we're open from 9 to 5 uh, on f Monday through Friday, and then Saturday and Sunday hours are a little bit shorter than that. They close a little earlier on Saturday and Sunday, but the, 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 they open at 12 on Sunday, I believe. And there is no admission fee. There's no admission fee. And that will do it for us. From everyone here at RPVTV, make it a great day.